If you've worked in acute care, you know that this is one of the most common complaints you're gonna see. And if you've had it yourself, you know how unsettling it can be. Chances are, you have. In a sample of the population in Canada, 70% of adults had had an episode of low back pain in the previous six months, and 22% described it as either high intensity or highly disabling. That's the relevance of the topic, and now the difficulty. Common sense would say that if someone's having back pain, something's wrong with their back. But the thing is, if you image an asymptomatic population, 37% of 20-year-olds will have disc degeneration. And among 70-year-olds, this number goes up to more than 90%. This makes it much harder to get to the bottom of what's causing the back pain in any individual patient. Let's say you see someone with back pain. You get an x-ray and find degenerative changes. You can't say that they're the cause, because you know that in all likelihood, they were already there long before the pain started. Before going on to the medical approach of back pain, let's define our scope. We're going to focus on patients with low back pain as a main complaint, rather than back pain as one of the secondary symptoms of a distinct clinical syndrome. Someone with kidney stones, for example, could start describing their pain as low back pain, but in your interview, you find out that it's actually colicky flank pain, or that they have a bunch of urinary symptoms. Or someone with an acute respiratory illness, feeling achy all over, would say yes to back pain in the review of systems, just as much as they would with any other body part. So let's go ahead and talk about patients who come in for low back pain. Instead of going by the traditional causes, manifestations, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, we're going to use a step-by-step -step approach. This corresponds with the priorities you should have clinically. This way follows how our minds actually work, so you're more likely to remember the important stuff when dealing with it in real life. The starting point we come off of is that most cases of low back pain do not have a serious underlying cause and tend to resolve on their own. But some do. Number one on our priority list is identifying the neurological threats. These patients are at risk of developing permanent neurological damage and need urgent surgical evaluation for decompression. The classical indications are cauda equina syndrome or otherwise severe or progressive neurological symptoms. Patients with any of these findings need immediate MRI for confirmation. Cauda equina syndrome is the triad of urinary retention, fecal incontinence, and saddle anesthesia. These are the signs and symptoms of dysfunction of the lower sacral segments. If you wanted to be neurologically correct, you'd make a distinction from conus medullaris syndrome, but most papers don't, and I won't either, because it really doesn't change the decision-making you have to do in the ED. People can have subtle degrees of these symptoms, so be proactive in asking about bowel or bladder habit changes, and keep in mind that urinary retention can actually present as incontinence when the bladder leaks from overdistension. Saddle anesthesia is a loss of sensation in the perineum, and because it is a negative symptom, you need to test it in order to bring it about. Luckily, there is no need for the embarrassment of directly palpating every patient. You can have them examine their own perineum and believe their response that they don't feel that it's numb or that the sensation is blunted. The other item is severe or progressive neurosymptoms. Pain and paresthesia, even though they are neurological functions, are subject to a lot of confounders, and fortunately, most patients do not go on to develop other types of neurological dysfunction even if they have what appears to be a convincing dermatomal distribution. Seemingly neurological complaints tend to have a gradient of specificity for actual neurological injury. Pain is at the bottom, followed by paresthesia, then numbness, then tendon reflexes, and then strength. So be sure to ask about and test for muscle strength of the lower extremities. Asking them to stand on their tippy toes tests for S1. Standing on their heels tests for L5, and the patellar reflex tests for L4, and it's pretty easy to get, even using your hands doing a karate chop. Any suspicion of weakness should be complemented by a thorough neurological exam, but never omit these three fundamental tests from your evaluation of back pain patients. So, convincing neurosymptoms means immediate MRI and neurosurgical consultation. We can now take a breather as the emergent causes have been taken care of but we haven't ruled out the other serious underlying illnesses yet. This is where the red flags come in handy. This term, which was made famous by a recent wave of memes, represents characteristics that are high risk for something seriously bad underneath. In this setting, we mean cancer and infection 
causing the back pain. As you can expect, the red flags are going to be the risk factors and manifestations of infection and cancer, and the indications that the pain is more serious overall. So, fever, night sweats, weight loss, tenderness to palpation or percussion, pain that's worse at night, pain for longer than 6 weeks, pain refractory to treatment, age greater than 50, history of cancer, history of immunosuppression, IV drug use, endocarditis or hemodialysis, and lastly, recent spinal surgery. Patients with any of these red flags should get x-rays and ESR and or CRP. These are screening type tests, being very sensitive and not as much specific, and positive findings should be further evaluated by MRI. I know that this is a pretty long list, but most patients do not present with any of these red flags, and this can help cut down on unnecessary tests. And to help remember the list, by remembering what it is that you're looking for, you can probably reverse engineer most of it on the spot. X-rays alone are about 50% sensitive for acute osteomyelitis or bone mats, ESR and CRP add another layer of around 90% sensitivity, and together with your flawless history taking not missing any red flags, you end up with a very safe net to pick up the serious stuff. There's one more condition that's not typically included, but I think should have its place here too. Triple A. A triple A that ruptures can cause pain, and although abdominal pain is more common, this study showed that 17% presented with low back pain only, and another 14% had both abdominal and low back pain. Even in a non-ruptured triple A, if it grows and starts eroding surrounding structures, it can cause back pain too, and that's a risk factor for rupture. Given the huge mortality of an aortic rupture, it's definitely something to look out for. So if a patient with a known AAA that's being monitored comes in with back pain, recognize this warning sign and have their aorta rechecked for size or rupture. And in the general population, whenever someone presents with back pain and signs of symptoms suggestive of hemodynamic instability, remember this diagnosis and they definitely deserve imaging and labs. Okay, after ruling this all out, we fell into the territory of non-specific low back pain. This concept includes people with and without radiculopathy, which is when the symptom distribution is compatible with a certain nerve root, sometimes but not always, meaning irritation of that root. This condition is frustrating to patients and doctors alike, because as the name implies, there is no easy answer. There may or may not be identifiable musculoskeletal abnormalities, such as disc herniations and bone spurs, but unfortunately their presence doesn't really help dictate the initial management. The natural history of disc herniations is retraction and reabsorption. So even when it is convincingly symptomatic, such as when there's pain and tingling in the exact dermatome of the disc herniation, the patient should have a trial of a conservative management. Degenerative changes, flexibility imbalances, excessive load or repetitive movement, and psychological factors all play a role here. So much so that there are the so-called yellow flags, which are psychological patterns that identify the patients who are least likely to improve from targeting organic pain, because they tend to have a strong psychosocial component causing their presentation. Even in chronic back pain, most randomized trials showed no benefit in surgery over further conservative treatment, highlighting the disconnection between findings of degenerative changes in the back and the pain. So how do we treat the pain then? The best way to look at it is as a tiered approach. Interventions go from common analgesics to stronger medications, adjunctive treatments, minimally invasive procedures, and surgery. They start here or here, according to the intensity of the pain, and then move across the tiers depending on the response to treatment. Also, keep in mind that a multimodal approach is your friend here. Going up a level doesn't mean letting go of the tier before, as you can get a synergistic effect from these approaches and minimize side effects while maximizing pain relief. First up, common analgesics. They have very little toxicity and usually can be bought without a prescription. Tylenol alone is not favored by most studies, but NSAIDs do work and combining the two can be even better. Be on the watch for kidney problems and ulcers in chronic use, but short-term use is okay unless you have certain health issues. Muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine and tizanidine also help, but they can make you sleepy. Topical treatments such as lidocaine patches, hot or cold packs, and topical NSAIDs can help too. Next level is opioids. 
tramadol, and codeine are considered weaker opioids, but studies show that they often achieve similar levels of analgesia with fewer side effects than the typical opioids. If the patient needs more, you can go to the stronger ones like morphine and oxycodone. This is a watershed step. Patients who've reached this level should definitely have an early follow-up with their primary physician, where they'll adjust meds and consider adjunctive treatments. These are other medications such as antidepressants and antiepileptics, which have efficacy in many chronic pain syndromes, physical therapy and exercise, psychological interventions such as CBT, and alternative treatments such as massage, acupuncture, and chiropraxis. RCTs showing benefit from each of these interventions are hard to come about. Obviously, this makes it difficult to affirm that they work, but a good reason for their absence is that it's hard to design a study with a legitimate control group when you'd have to blind people from knowing whether or not they had a massage. In any case, they're low risk and worth a try. Okay, coming back to acute therapy. If a patient requires repeated doses of strong opioids, they're refractory to standard therapy. Two things now happen. They are candidates for pain procedures, and they qualify as a red flag. So, consult your pain team, get the x-ray in labs, and probably admit them. At a minimum, they'll require titration of pain meds over the next couple of days, and they may need interventional procedures and physical therapy evaluation for rehab. The procedures are direct injections of glucocorticoids or analgesics, infusions such as ketamine drips, Botox injections, and in the case of vertebral compression fractures, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. You noticed I hadn't said anything about osteoporotic vertebral fractures before, which definitely sounds like it could be a serious etiology, and in fact some sources, such as UpToDate, include it in their red flag list. I do not think it should be a red flag for a few reasons. One is that the identification of a vertebral fracture does not change the immediate management, only if they have the neuro threats. Patients only qualify for any procedure if they fail standard therapy. Since being refractory to therapy puts them in the red flag basket, they would then be imaged and the fracture would be found. Still, this knowledge would not change how the ED or hospitalist manages them, only helping the pain service figure out which procedure they indicate. Other than that, the only benefit of diagnosing a compression fracture is for future prevention, since one osteoporotic fracture is a risk factor for another one. But placing people on osteoporosis treatment is something that only accrues benefit in the long run and is a long-term daily med. Therefore, it should be started by the patient's primary care physician, and arranging PCP follow-up is something that you'd already do regardless. And at last, osteoporosis is very rare unless the patient is either elderly or on chronic steroids, both of which are already present in our red flag list, so the fracture would have been caught anyways. So, adding vert fractures to the list adds complexity without adding benefit. Alright, enough with the rent. The final step in symptomatic treatment is surgery. And as we'd said before, in the absence of etiologies uncovered by steps 1 and 2, back surgery has no place in acute back pain. I add this section here because it's part of the spectrum of the treatment in general, so it helps make up a complete picture in your head. As I said, the average chronic back pain patient is not likely to benefit from doing it. There's no hard and fast rule to select which patients are indeed likely to benefit from surgery, and this is a definition that the spine specialist, be them ortho or neurosurgery, are going to have to make. In general, you filter out the patients that improved from symptomatic therapy after a trial of at least one year, and then, among the ones that remained, you balance the likelihood that the pain is organic and mechanical with the patient's low yellow flags and surgical risk. The possible surgeries are spinal fusions, laminectomies, uh, or disc evacuations or replacements, or a combination of any of these. Alright, this was quite the long one, so let's recap. Patient presenting with low back pain. First, actively look for the neuro threats and get the MRI. Find out about any red flags, screen them with x-rays, ESR and CRP, and follow through with the ones that test positive. Treat everyone's pain using the tier level approach. And make sure to arrange a follow up visit with their PCP or spine specialist. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.